I hope everybody uh, can see this. Um, um, the subtitle here is Decentralized Identifiers, Verifiable Credentials, Federated Ecosystems, and all that. Because this is really um, the uh, central tenants, the building blocks for the web of trust. Um, so let's uh, dig into um, those things, the IDs, verifiable credentials, and federated ecosystems. All right. So how does trust work online today? And by the way, if you have uh, a super urgent question, please ask. Um, otherwise, um, you know, hold it, uh, write it down, put it in the chat. We'll get to it guaranteed. So after this out of the way, so how do I prove who I am digitally as an organization or an individual today, right, um, uh, online? So we have our beloved SSL certificate, certificates, HTTPS, um, social proofs, copy of physical documents, right? Many, many things. Um, these provide, however, only a degree of trust, but there's currently no way to directly link data to trust anchors, to these trust anchors, right? Um, for example, to um, Microsoft.com, right? That's a that's a trust anchor, right? You know that Microsoft controls that domain. So if something comes, provably comes from Microsoft.com, you can trust it. For example, right, um, where this is, uh, um, where this breaks down is if I receive a file, the file is generally static and does not have any or very limited security features. It might be encrypted. I might received an email with a password, but that doesn't tell me anything um, about how um, authentic the content is. So you've seen the blue tick on social media sites like Instagram and Twitter, right? So um, question is, wh why do we trust this, right? Why do we say, oh, this is actually Netflix? Because we assume Instagram has done corporate know your customer on Netflix and made an attestation as to Netflix identity. That blue tick is that attestation, that credential. Um, and we were, and it works because the blue tick is part of the overall technical architecture of Instagram, part of their HTTPS domain, so to speak, right? So meaning Instagram users feel a degree of certainty and confidence in this attestation because they trust Instagram. Well, up to a point, right? So um, this is a form of a, this blue tick is a, is a form of a, of a credential with about Netflix with Instagram uh, as a trust anchor, and that works. Um, um, that works. Um, but why do we not trust this? Get an order receipt from Amazon, even with a blue tick, uh, it could not really be trusted because it would not be open um, on a trusted platform, right? Um, so therefore, one cannot trace the root of trust back to any authoritative issuer. Um, as with the with the uh, Instagram and Netflix example, right? Anybody can uh, generate this and, and and email it to you. So now this um, is the space. This trust gap is that's where DIDs and VCs come in. Right? Decentralized or federated trust. So the combination of DIDs and VCs, verifiable credentials. And decentralized identifiers solves the provenance and identity problem. Um, so it's like as the blue tick for any physical and digital data. So using cryptography and new innovative technical standards, which are currently developed by the W3C, uh, one can now attach a trusted digital assertion through a signature, a digital signature, to data such as an Amazon order, in both the digital and physical realms. So now I can I can I can um, imbue the order that I receive as a PDF um, with with um, uh, with a trust um, certificate, so to speak, um, 
through uh, through a digital signature that I can link back to, for example, Amazon. So how does it work? So decentralized and federated trust is a way of verifying data by using a unique identifier that is attached to that. You can think of it like a car and its license plate. So a verifiable credential, um, it's like the registration of the car and lo and behold, Moby has uh, a, a vehicle identity, a, a VID certificate defined, a standard for that. Right, so you can provide information about the type and make and specs. Um, they're very clear and very difficult to fake these credentials. And they're an established standard. Um, uh, happy to share links to those to those standards um, uh, um, after the, the lecture. Decentralized identifiers um, are like the car license number because they provide information about who owns the car, uh, and they can be checked against, for example, a, tr a trusted registry, just like you would it would uh, do with with a, a Department of Motor Vehicles, right? Um, except now you don't need a centralized entity anymore, like the Department of Motor Vehicles. Now you can do it in a federated or even fully decentralized manner. Now applying, the, applying this to the real world. So example here uh, of a fair file credential. Um, uh, so there's relevant information about what type the credential is, what would be visible on the, that would be something like what would be visible on the car exterior. So here on the right-hand side, you can see um, an example of a, um, of a credential um, that is, um, uh, for a product registration. As you can see, it says product registration credential, but it could be a car registration. So the top part here, the upper section shows that this is a product registration credential um, with a standardized vocabulary through the context, right? You know, it's, it's, it's a credential because it says so, and it gives you um, uh, um, a resolvable link to the ontology that is used to construct um, the uh, uh, not only the credential but mo most importantly uh, the um, content of the credential subject which is uh, coming up very shortly so it also has an issuer an id and name fields show which authoritative party issued the data so you can now uh, as a third party to check that it is legitimate like a car registration Right, so this is where where uh, the federation comes um, comes in. If a federation like uh, Moby MobyNet oh man, <clears throat> will will issue uh, a credential like this, then um, it has its own ID, it's, uh, the DID, and um, you can then uh, resolve that back to um, a real world uh, uh, to to, to the keys that have signed the credential and then um, uh, also go, um, follow that back to the trust domain, such as the Mobi, uh, um, the Mobi um, domain. Uh, this is uh, after the issuance with an issuance date and expiration date, obviously. Um, you have a credential subject. So this is the heart of the matter, so to speak. Uh, this section describes the details of the credential. Uh, in the case of, uh, in, the, in this case, the idea of the car or um, of the GTIN um, and the exact name of the credential. There can be obviously a lot more information um, in this, um, but I wanted to be able to fit it on one page. So I minimized it. And then below, uh, you see the credential status. The status allows someone to check if the credential actually has been revoked, right? Because you can have a, right, you, you, you see that um, um, if it has an expiration date, you know that past that date, it's no good anymore. But um, for example, if you have a driver's license and the driver's license has been quote unquote taken away from you, that just means that your driver's license has been revoked. The expiration date is still in the future, um, so if you want to check whether a driver's license is valid, 
you not only need to check, um, you know, expiration date, but also check whether, um, you know, uh, it has been revoked. So that's what the credential status is for. Um, now the evidence uh, provides a link to specific reference data, for example, the uh, engine specs, wheels, brakes, gearbox, et cetera. And then the proof um, allows the verification of the is issuer signature, right? So I can now, because I because it is linked to the to the DID of the of the uh, of the issuer, I can now check um, um, by resolving the DID to um, an underlying document um, called the DID document that um, yes, this key. Um, is indeed um, uh, is indeed uh, um, part of this DID document that that uh, defines the uh, um, uh, the DID, and I've retrieved it from um, uh, a trusted environment such as Microsoft.com or a blockchain, right? Because a blockchain once it's there, you can't really can't really uh, um, alter it. So. Of a high degree of trust that if if that was uh, anchored on chain or at Microsoft.com, um, that that DID document um, is correct. Now, after this, um, admittedly a bit contrived example, how, how does this work in the real world? Also, well, Denso needs to send an emergency uh, piece to BMW. Um, there is there is uh, um, you know, a spec, for example. So um, they go to FedEx and say, "Hey, I have a package here for BMW." Okay, great. Um, and they provide them with with a um, with with data about it. Uh, let me check that this data is actually trusted. So um, and and then uh, Denzo goes, "Well, we have signed the BMW package data using our public signature, so you you can look that up." So FedEx will go, oh, great. We'll go look that up, check the, the, uh, um, uh, the digital, digital signature. Um, and they could read the digital signature, for example, from a, from a, from a QR code on, um, on a label. That's entirely possible. Uh, and then verify it online. Um, so this is wonderful. So uh, um, FedEx can now, can now trust what's in the package because it has been attested by, by Denso and verified by FedEx. So FedEx now ships this part to BMW. Um, and they're doing that and they issue their own transportation data referencing the verified package data from Denso. So BMW now receives this package and goes, oh, great. Well, first, let me check whether you FedEx really um, uh, did anything to that. Um, that checks out, right? Um, they, they verify that the credential has the right structure and has the right data in it. And then they do the same uh, um, with the Denso cr credential that um, FedEx has also presented to um, BMW. Um, and uh, so the, the data references, again, the public identifiers, the DIDs, and they are connected to legal entities and connected and verifiable package credentials. So now um, uh, BMW has a verified journey of this product package from Denso. And I obviously showed only like uh, a simplified representation here, but this is how this can, this, uh, this uh, in part already does work in the, in the, um, in the real world. Um, how you can use these credentials and in, um, in a, in a, uh, a shipping supply chain, for example. Creating a trusted federation, right? So after all these examples, um, so it's important, and we're, we're showing here those who are, who are, who are willing participants in, in, uh, in, in MobiNet, oh man, since every company in the Federation will have a verified legal identifier, any company can issue to and verify data from another company in the ecosystem, right? Because we, because um, Mobi will issue the sort of like the anchoring credential for all its members. 
and then uh, um, the uh, members can now issue um, fair public credentials about parts, um, about orders, about invoices, um, about services um, to each other, and they can they can they can verify them directly through the aid of of um, of the network and the trust anchor, which is Mopi. This obviously then uh, creates maximum efficiency and trust across the life cycle of a product, for example, such as a car. So um, this uh, data sharing enables now complete visibility over the what, where, and how for entire supply chains at the same time. And if you're worried about um, privacy, uh, there are there are ways how to do this um, also in zero knowledge um, that requires, as I like to call, um, propeller head crypto. Um, um, but it, it works um, and it is entirely doable. So after this um, uh, brief introduction and, and concepts and a couple of examples. Um, what is Moby actually doing about this trusted federation? So, um, you know, uh, how is Moby building a trusted federation? Uh, through the open mobility network, um, building, it's building MobyNet, right? OMN is community built and operated business automation network, right? Um, that's, that's the whole, that's that's really uh, the goal here is 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 um, the equivalent of the internet for business um, automation because that offers multiple uh, offers mobility stakeholders and related businesses an open and inclusive uh, core services infrastructure um, that allows uh, um, people to operate um, in a trusted fashion um, anywhere anytime. Uh, especially with with um, uh, with the economy um, at the edge, um, where devices, cars, scooters, trucks, um, laptops, uh, smartphones, sensors um, will produce valuable information um, about uh, the state that they're in. So, um, which can be used for insurance, um, which can be used to, to charge for, for, for services. Um, so there, there's a multi-trillion dollar uh, future mobility um, economy that is currently um, emerging, um, especially re-emerging after, after COVID. So compared to incumbent platforms, you know, Omen brings together uh, companies to offer more integrated and reliable uh, may I say also bundled digital services um, within a trusted network. Why bundled? I'll, I'll get to that in a, um, in a second. While protecting their property rights, relationships, value chain, and brand. I, it's all about um, the trust within that uh, uh, federation and around that the um, initial, <coughs> initial trust anchor, Moby. So OMN is therefore a member-owned cooperative that provides safe and secure mobility services for all members. So that's great. Where's OMN now? Right? Where's what is what is it? Well, OMN has started to build MobiNet. Um, the current OMN infrastructure exists. We have a prototype um, of a trust layer, which are the core services that are depicted on the left-hand side. If that looks a little complicated, um, uh, it is under the hood. Um, however, um, for any participant, these are just RESTful APIs that uh, that can be called by any application. Um, so what we also need is interoperability. So we've also built interoperability layer, which we call user agent. Right, because they the applications are 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 identities. They have ident they will have um, identifiers that are issued by about them that are issued by the um, by the entities that that produce that application. 
right? Um, if that had been common practice, for example, the entire solar wind hack would not have happened. So um, uh, one of the learnings here is yes, um, when you have an application, it actually should have a DID um, um, of the company that, that, that produced it. But in order to be able to um, communicate with one another in a standardized way, there needs to be um, this uh, interoperability layer, this abstraction layer um, that consists of you know, uh, gateway authentication, um, a wallet, um, you, know, you need to issue and verify VCs, you need to share data, and you better have some encrypted data vault in there as well. So this is, this is the um, abstraction layer that every, every um, application and product um, in that uh, federated ecosystem uh, will operate with in order to A, interact with the core services, because the core services also have a user agent, as well as each other as is depicted on the on the on the picture here on the um, on the left now the interesting thing is what applications what products um because that's really the next step right so um we need to you know launch the network which we're hoping to achieve um very soon this year and build products uh, on top of that all man infrastructure um, to bring to bring Mobinet to 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 um, to life. So um, there, there are things around end to end uh, device provenance, um, uh, asset titling, right? We talked about the car. Um, there, there are other things that that you can now turn into into assets data. Um, uh, for example, your sustainability data uh, will be, you know, become an asset that can be traded. Um, you will have, have to have real-time asset management, right? IoT sensor networks um, will have to produce and will produce um, a lot of data that needs to be uh, verified and trusted. Um, if not, you can, you can do all kinds of uh, shenanigans with it. Um, uh, um, so tracking and tracing. Um, we talked about that with the example with 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 uh, Denzel FedEx and BM, BMW um, device registration. Again, that's really important. If you're if you're receiving something from a from a device, can you trust it? Right? Has it been registered, verified? Um, secure data services. Again, uh, talked about that asset data monetization. Right. Um, <clears throat> Can I use my data, for example, to reduce my insurance rate? Um, can I use uh, my data to get a better maintenance deal um, for my um, electric vehicle because I'm willing to share um, the state of my car battery? And that obviously altogether allows for a more seamless regulatory compliance um, uh, environment because everything can now more readily be um, verified by, regu <clears throat> by regulators, my apologies, um, in real time, uh, um, if required, if, if the regulator becomes, becomes part of the federated, federated ecosystem, part of the network, then they can, they can see what's going on and they can uh, um, easily request the necessary data to be shared um, with them. So, um, that's why um, this infrastructure that we have built, the core service and the interoperability layer are really, really important. So the next step is, uh, again, to reiterate, and this is really important, and this is where the invitation is coming in, is we need participants um, to launch the network um, first in test, and then later on in production. Production obviously only makes sense once there are actual applications slash products that are running on top of that. And that is sort of like the next ask. So um, there are, there are um, uh, programs under Mobi that where companies are coming together to actually build products, such as around uh, um, uh, usage-based insurance, um, uh, electrical vehicle charging, um, and potentially then also uh, we have a 
collaborations with 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 uh, uh, telecom industry standards bodies um, such as CBAN, the Communications Business Automation Network, and now also MEF, the Metro Ethernet Forum, uh, who want to launch a similar network um, as as MobiNet, um, that we can bring those together um, uh, um, and then really build out. Um, uh, a business automation internet um, cross industry, um, not only cross company, but also cross uh, um, cross industry. So call for action and the invitation is join us on this journey, help us launch the network, help us build products, help us build the business automation internet. Thank you. Thanks, Andreas. Does anybody have any questions? Just jump in, unmute yourselves. Thanks for your presentation, Andreas. It was very interesting. You're welcome. It's been a little overwhelming or was it was it that was it a total was it a total snooze <laughs> uh, andreas uh, this is boris i i think this was like this is uh the idea is that i've been reading quite a bit uh, i was trying to like uh, read quite a bit on uh on uh, on the internet and like the material i can get a hold of so so and this was very helpful I think you 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 really, uh, I, I, yeah. It it was very helpful at, from from a technical perspective. Uh, obviously, just a half an hour not can get into a lot of details, but also the connection to the business. Uh, it was uh, to me it was very uh, a lot of good information. And I do have a quick question. Um, it doesn't necessarily limit. I mean, any type of business potentially that requires dids and 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 the, the type of presence on a yeah, presence out there can be considered, right? Yeah, any business. Yes, um, it's 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 not uh, um, it's not mobility only or telecommunication only. Any business, right. and and uh, <clears throat> in fact, we're looking at being able to deliver bundled services from uh, um, so cross industry right so you 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 don't want to you know you you go to amazon and buy you know your your dish soap and your tv right and your <clears throat> and your mattress right so similarly you want to go to one provider and and get all the digital services for um for um you know your needs right insurance vehicle charging connectivity um, uh, um, uh, assistance, digital uh, AI assistance, right? Um, mm -hmm. AI at the at the edge. So um, yeah, that that's that's the um, that's the that's the end game, right? So you want to have have the the uh, Amazon equivalent um, of 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 uh, digital service bundling. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Andreas, this is this is Chris. The slide you have up shows the monet the many monetization opportunities. What you call you refer to as the the trillions of dollars of economic transactions that can occur uh, in an automated business network with applications built on top of the network. Correct. What about in the network itself? uh the uh, other monetization opportunities what uh, what is used to fund the network is it transaction fees is it uh, something else very good very good very good very good question so um obviously you, the 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 operators of the network um can do it either out of out of uh, fully um alt altruistic motives that is probably not very likely so therefore um, we can think of this network as a scarce public good and with scarce public goods, such as parking, for example, um, you often pay a fee, right? And you pay um, typically a usage fee, 
not always, right? You can, you as you know, keeping the parking um, example, you can, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, rent a parking space um, uh, on a monthly basis, um, and uh, but you can also pay it um, as you go. Right, so um, the, the the monetization opportunities here are are uh, manifold. So um, on a transaction basis, um, on 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 certain services that are that are um, that are that are provided uh, um, uh, to the network. Um, one of the key things is that, um, and I think I haven't stressed this enough, is that uh, this is all built on standards. Right, uh, standards not only um, for um, from from one standards body, but, but from many standards uh, standards bodies. So um, we can um, hold on for one second. Sorry. I was uh, kids yelling and the dog scratching at the same time. Oh well. Um, so so um, providing, and there's there's the opportunity for many also different service providers to to go in and you know operate network nodes on behalf of uh, uh, companies. That's another uh, uh, provide software um, um, into this. Um, so. Uh, um, uh, specific implementation that um, when built against the standard will produce the same outcomes. They are just built by different companies and uh, these companies uh, um, can charge for that. So, so there are within the network itself, there are many, many um, um, opportunities. For example, if the, if the network offers uh, payment opportunities, there is a, uh, uh, then the ability to to charge for those, obviously, um, there will also, um, as 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 this matures, be opportunities to um, um, have, um, for example, um, the asset data monetization um, built into the network um, as a um, uh, um, as an exchange, for example, and an exchange that you pay uh, fees fees for if you use it. Right, and it's then, and these fees are distributed to all the to all the the network operators. So, um, long answer to your to to your question. Not only are there um, inherent monetization opportunities at this point in time, there will be more and even bigger monetization opportunities as the network matures and grows. Andres, uh, this is Dan. I, I have a question. Uh, how is the Oman uh, blockchain? Uh, is it a uh, public or it's a private blockchain? Obviously, when the network faces the user, I mean, it should be a public blockchain, but for the operators maintaining the nodes, it should be a private. So how actually, you know, how, how is it structured? And, and the other question, uh, what is the method to, to implement the isn't in fault tolerance. Sure. Uh, let me let me go back and and I'm not going to zoom in, but I'm 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 going to highlight. Wait a second. Um, I can do this here. Um, you should be able to see this. So um, the one that I'm that I've here, what you can see, those are different. DLTs. So the core services, the network actually um, can consist of multiple DLTs um, uh, and actually will, right? So we don't have to, we can do Ethereum, we can do Cardano, we can do Polkadot, we can do uh, Corda, we can do Fabric. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, that's, that's one of the key. Uh, the key tans is that uh, this is agnostic um, to the underlying uh, um, chains. So the network will endorse more than one chain and it will be operated at the same time together. So a, a node, core services node, um, 
we'll have to operate multiple um, different uh, DLT nodes at the same time. Um, and the question um, to Byzantine fault tolerant, um, well, Corda is not Byzantine fault tolerant. <laughs> it's not designed to be like, like that, it doesn't have to. Um, uh, Ethereum is. So, um, uh, you know, bring your own, uh, bring your own, own uh, um, ecosystem chain, um, get it approved. Um, and um, then one of the criteria is, are going to be securities. There is actually a standard, um, standard specs around um, DLTs um, uh, that uh, we've taken over from, from, from CBAN, where it has been um, developed. There's a spec around this core services architecture um, and, and what criteria um, uh, the DLTs that, that should be operated um, or that, that can be operated um, within uh, this network um, have to have, provably have to have. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And actually, you know, the question was related to the previous questions on monetization uh, because on a private uh, blockchain, <clears throat> obviously the nodes do not monetize for executing the transactions. So the monetization just happens at the interface of the user with the blockchain, not, not uh, for the operators of the blockchain. So it's, it is very interesting, you know, how, how you combine the two concepts. And you can, you can, you can, you can push the monetization all the way down. You can, you can, there's, there's no reason why, you know, if you, why you're not charging a per transaction fee. It doesn't even have to be charged, you know, as you said, it doesn't have to be charged on chain, but it can, right? So, um, you know, if, if you're mm -hmm. running Ethereum, it's built in, mm -hmm. right? Right. You have, you have, you have, you have, you have gas, so you pay for your gas. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's uh, um, that's that is not that's not uh, um, that's not not a uh, not a problem. Right. And you can you can you can create a if you want you can have one that has a protocol token that is extra secure. Right. So you run a, a like proof of stake or um, such that you know the the operators will actually gain. Um, uh, these protocol tokens. So one of the upshots of that is um, these tokens actually will gain in value the more the network is used, right? That's the, because, because they represent a measure of, of network usage. Right, yeah. Thank you. So a, a, a good um, uh, model for thinking about the monetization sort of, of transaction fees within the private network uh, and outside within applications, I think, is the Visa network, where the Visa network is supported by uh, transaction fees, not only of members, but of, uh, of the public, as well as membership fees, as well as member resources that are devoted to running the network. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Do we have any other questions? Hello, Andreas. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay, uh, my name is Richard Mill, calling in from Sweden. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation today. Uh, Andreas, I have a question about, uh, sorry, it's the dreaded uh, GDPR uh, question. Uh, well, I know everything here, uh, corporation to corporation is, uh, I'm not worried about the GDPR there. I'm a bit confused of how users can get into this. Uh, and any, if any of these transactions make it onto a blockchain that would carry any personal data in from the customers. I was wondering- No. Could... Okay. There, there's, there's not, um, but you, you raise a very, very good question, very valid point. So um, what would happen that if, if individuals um, um, would have, if they directly utilize services or could have, um, uh, DIDs, right? 
um, what they would do, they would run um, similar to organizations, they would run um, uh, the user agent on their on their um, on their devices because it's not uh, it's a it's a thin client. Um, and there you have an encrypted data vault, right? So that that can keep your your data, which you can which you can which you can share, right? Um, and so all the sensitive data stays on the user agent in a in an in an uh, um, in an encrypted uh, um, format and under the control of uh, the individuals, and they can then choose to share that with um, with. Uh, um, uh, with others. By the way, the the one point about the encrypted data vault, um, you can run multiple user agents on diff on the different uh, on different devices, um, and uh, they will replicate the data. So you have it available everywhere, as long as you're connected to the internet. Okay, so if I'm a just a personal user, I can act like a corporation. I can create a DID and I can anchor it to a blockchain. Uh, and then that's under my own power. The thing's all under my own private key that I hold on the edge. That's good. But if I send out a transaction to someone, say I share data, what I don't know is, is a hash of the transaction put onto a blockchain or is the transaction, no. is, there, is there any uh, data? It's property? entirely off chain. This is entirely, this is entirely off chain. On chain, the core services are, are only around identity yeah. management and assurance. Assurance is about, if you, if your application up here, right? If your application up here um, um, has the opportunity to utilize a core service that um, um, effectively uh, um, uh, creates a, a a snapshot of the state of the application um, uh, on the network. So if you want to to uh, a trusted one. So if you want to uh, join this application. I want to make sure that everything was was kosher. You can check when was the last uh, um, when was the last state update, and you can you can then um, <clears throat> validate that 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 state that you, that is publicly visible and verifiable corresponds to the state that you see on the application, right? So you can rest assured that you know um, nothing untoward. Um, has happened because it's 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 verifiable. So those are the those are the core services that are that are that are currently provided. There will in the future there'll there'll be more, um, but they will all be constructed with with um, with the um, uh, with user with user privacy um, uh, in mind. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? All right, I think not. Andreas, thank you again for answering all those questions. I think everyone learned a lot. Um, I wish you and all of our guests a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a Thank great you. day. Thank Bye -bye. You.